delighted to say we have um, with us Asra Osman Rani, who's the CEO of AirAsia X. And I think without more ado, I might invite him up on the stage because he flew up last night for this and he has to leave very, very shortly. I uh, really appreciate that, Asra. Thanks for coming up. And now I'm going to punish you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I, I think, how long have we got? What time have we got to go? 10.15. 15, okay. We've got about 20 minutes. Uh, I'll try and give a little bit of time for questions from, from the floor. Um, so, you know, wave your hand wildly if you want to talk. But uh, I, I do want to just grill you a little bit first. Um, I was saying to you before, I'd like you to sort of go through where AirAsia X came from. But maybe I could just sort of leap from that and perhaps go back to it. I think a lot of you know what AirAsia X is. Um, it's a hybrid. <laughs> it's a long haul, low cost airline. But let me just, just, uh, just sort of, I was, I was thinking when Andy was talking, uh, the, the cargo issue, for example, uh, just as a matter of definition, is that hybridization or is that ancillary product? Mm, neither. First of all, we have a very different outlook on cargo. Uh, cargo is a booming sector for us, it's growing from 2% of our revenue to well over 5% of our revenue. Load factors have gone uh, about well above 50%, uh, and it's a significant uh, margin contribution uh, to the business. Uh, it continues to grow. Um, so I think that the difference is it's, it's a sector that basically has been lazy because it was uh, the status quo industry. People, as you know, price similarly and, and do the same products. And We've come in and shook everything up, not just in the price point, but also the service point, creating a whole uh, online customer service model uh, for cargo, and, and that's really taken off my storm. So I think it's just uh, a sector that's just been lazy and needs to be woken up. But for a purist, that is that is not part of the low cost airline model. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you why, because I think the purists are wrong. Um, the difference is, and, and why I'm anti hybridization and anti convergence, is it's a mistake, I think, to think about these different things that you do uh, are bringing you closer to the traditional model. What's important is not to judge uh, the outcomes based on the, the things that you do, whether it's cargo or long term, but the net result, which is, are you still um, at you know, the lowest unit cost position? And that's critical because in any industry, whether it's fashion, retail, automotive, telecommunications, financial services, we all know that you know, the business models that can succeed are the ones that either have a very strong premium positioning or a very mass market lowest cost position. The guys in the middle, even countries in the middle, are the ones that are getting squeezed. So just because airlines are trying to figure out, you know, sort of evolving their models and doing some things doesn't necessarily mean that the uh, net outcome for the industry is it would be coming to the middle because the middle ground is an unsustainable position, right? Some airlines are moving one way or the other because, you know, for example, uh, you know, I would argue Virgin Australia used to be one end of the spectrum, but it's something they got leapfrogged by even more lower unit costs, and so they've got two choices. You either think you can beat them on cost, or you have to move to, to the other end because in the middle is not a sustainable position. So. I think if, you, if you're judging uh, these different models based on uh, some people are trying to do it, but if it leads to a unit cost structure where you're stuck in the middle, you, you're not going to be around for the next five, ten years. So I, I don't think it's going to converge in the middle. I think ultimately the winners are still going to be uh, the polar ends of the spectrum. Yeah, I mean, obviously we're playing with definitions a little mm -hmm. bit here. Yeah, it's, it's very hard to sort of get away from them. But that there are two key aspects we're talking about. I mean, one is cost and one is yield. Sure. And, and, and a lot of what we talk about when we talk about hybridization is actually going after yield. But not, not at the expense of cost. Well, that's, that I think and, is and critical. I think that, that's where the execution is, is, tri uh, is tricky because if in the pursuit of yield you think, oh, I, I can start adding cost, but the reality is once you find yourself in the middle and you don't have the same kind of yield power as, as long as there are people with a much stronger yield position, you can't survive. Now, it's unique because in, in North America, it's a different situation because 
there's, there isn't the Singapore Airlines you know, price premium uh, equivalent because the guys with the highest cost also are the ones with the crappiest product. <laughs> right? So that's a bit screwed up. Uh, but generally, it, you have to look at where you are relative to the players in, in, in the space that you're competing. But once you start, and I, I will insist, compromising the model by changing mm -hmm. away from the very, very poor cool model that Ryanair operates, mm -hmm. you... That's because Ryanair thought that the only way you can achieve the lowest cost was to do it this way. What we've just proven is, no, Mr. Valeri, you're not, uh, you don't have to knock me all answers because we've now created a model that is different with an even lower yield cost. That's not to say, you know, we're hybridizing, we're adding all these things, and therefore we have a high yield cost than high air. Right? That's the difference. Some people might be doing these things and then suddenly they find themselves at the six cents, seven cents per, per cost per seat kilometer, then, then they're, they're going into the, the no man's land in the middle. What we're saying is, just like EasyJet discovering today, hey, you can do seat allocations and it doesn't increase costs and it doesn't affect the rock. We figured that out in 2007, right? It's just, you know, people in Europe are a bit slow. Okay, yeah, but I mean, that comparison, you've got a lower cost, yeah, and I agree, yeah. <laughs> uh, you've got a lower cost base to start, um, so that sort of strict, straight comparison is, is perhaps a bit unfair, but the point is, as soon as you start... Are you referring to labor, because labor is... No, 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 I just mean overall, your... your, your but that's fuel because look. of the model, right? I mean, fuel, we, we don't buy fuel at a lower price than, than Ryanair. Um, you know, we fly to airports like Haneda, which is a very expensive airport, but you have to be very creative in coming up with a model that delivers that, you know, cost advantage. But what I'm saying to you is, AirAsia compared with AirAsia, AirAsia X compared with AirAsia X. As soon as you start adding real estate in front of the aircraft, mm -hmm. as soon as you start catering for cargo, you're adding cost. No, you're not. If, if that were the case, why is my unit cost um, lower than AirAsia's unit cost? Because you fly along the risk. If you're doing it on an ASK basis, that's, well, that's yeah, easy. But, you know, on a, on a, uh, as long as you're, uh, you know, the... That, that's basically um, you know, the, the, the cost per flight, and you know, it's, it's still there. I mean, it's, it's not like something. But it costs you more, <coughs> you wear Azure X, not comparing with anybody else. It costs you more to cater for cargo. So your cost base must go up a bit. Okay, you're getting revenue from that, so your income improves, but your cost base is going up. Your cost base goes up when you add business class seats in the front because your, your cost per seat Actually, is going to increase. Because because, uh, um, you know, the, the physical cost of the seats isn't a significant factor. What was the, the big cost, estate. yeah, what was the big, uh, the, the real estate is the same. It's just other airlines decide, oh, you know, they spend millions on lounges and wine and champagne and all that stuff. And that's where the cost comes in. And so actually, you, if you deliver just the seat with the blanket and, and the pillow, it's, it's a negligible uh, cost. But your unit seat cost must go up if you have less seats per real estate. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about the, 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 other, the other sort of things that Andy was talking about before. Um, uh, the, the alliances issue, the relationships issue. Sure. Now you've obviously got a very big relationship with AirAsia. Mm. Um, and and, and in, in, in many respects you've been um, very, very different from any other model that's trying to go long haul because you've got that network ability right. over, over KL particularly. Yeah. But presumably in other pubs as well. Um, has that ever cost for you? Um, Interlife okay. connect connectivity? Well, it's, you, you can argue, well, we had to reprogram the Navitaire system. But again, it's not, it's not a material ongoing cost. You just re reconfigure how do you create two bookings at once. So mm -hmm. That's not a material uh, cost. Would you hold an aircraft for connections then? A few minutes. Yep. Uh, so it's a cost. No, it's not a cost because there there isn't an opportunity cost, right? So it's not like I would have been able to get one extra sector for you know holding up a flight for 15 minutes because of a, a typhoon in Taipei. But do that four times a day. Well, you're, not, you're not going to do it four times a day. Four times a day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but every year you do that twice a day. That's that's going to. No, because the, you're, you're not. If, if we did not wait, we wouldn't have added any more flights. <laughs> I just got the feeling.
It's not enough to figure that out. <laughs> We're from the prospectus. <laughs> and of course, yeah, you've got the opportunity very shortly to buy shares of Erosure X, if you were to please to know about. And I'm not going to ask you about uh, anything on that. What, what's the timing on that? Huh? The timing on that? We're not in market S rate. Soon. Good, good, good. Um, with any other partnerships, do you, do you see the prospect of partnering yeah. with anybody else but Aaron? I, I think so, but I think the, one of the key things we've learned is the principle is the brand. And one of the problems we see with the legacy model of alliances is there is no brand ownership, right? Because you know, you've got different national brands and the overarching alliance umbrella doesn't have a very strong consumer-facing brand. Right? Whereas in our model, what we see over the next five, ten years in any industry is the brand relationship with the consumer is going to matter a lot more. So yes, there's definitely room for partnerships, very much like the way uh, we have a partnership with a in Japan, uh, except instead of an alliance, what's important to us is same brand, same Erish.com website, same Erish and Facebook page, because that's where the consumers are interacting with you. Uh, so you can bring partnerships under fold, but it has to be but big believers in the brand. We wouldn't go into a partnership if you know, it wasn't an Aerasia branded uh, agreement. Well, let's just look at Japan, for example. Um, so you, you've got Aerasia Japan, which is an entity in its own right. It is a partnership, obviously, between sure. Aerasia and, and, uh, and Anna. Um, Aerasia X is operating to a different airport mm -hmm. from where they'll be based. Yep. What sort of considerations go into to making sure those, those two operations match? Because presumably you want to hub off uh, yeah, era, yeah, I do. Era right. Japan. In, in 2012, right, the only slots we would be able to get from Narita or Haneda are nighttime slots. Right. So either way, you're not going to have a, a great fee. So I might as well go to Haneda and have a great point to point service. Mm -hmm. uh, the next year going forward, I think if, if there are daytime slots that are available at, at Narita, absolutely would be interested in that because uh, Tokyo as a whole is certainly big enough for a double daily service. Mm -hmm. You'd never go to a Ibaraki, for example, or something like that? No, no, I think, uh, you know, for us, uh, the biggest consideration is the model works, you, you, as you mentioned, yes, you have a lot of these, uh, you have a lot more uh, units because we fly longer, but it works when you can fill up the planes, right? It works when we have more than an 80% load factor. So uh, the catchment, the ability to fill up the plane, both on the passenger side and the cargo side, uh, trumps um, airport. So, what, well, taking your Japan service, for example, out of KL, what's, what's the, uh, the, what are the components in the passenger profile? Uh, where, where are they coming from? Okay, it, it's, it's evolved. When we first started, we were at about 25% uh, Japanese. Now we're well over 40% uh, Japanese uh, in, in barely two years. Uh, it, uh, let's see, it's, it's getting, I think, quite, quite a distributed mix uh, across the different. Uh, age group of consumer segments, uh, but still predominantly um, online. Um, and I think you know, brand awareness has definitely escalated. And the fact that we have AirAsia Japan kicking up means the AirAsia brand as a whole is, is accelerating in terms of awareness. And that's a great spillover for us. Have you had to use agents though to get that um, Japan counted up? Um, sub 10%. Sub 10%. Cost? Hmm? Cost? Well, it's, it's available. Well, you know, what they don't have access to are the promotional fares, right? So uh, if the regular fares uh, is something that it, it looks like it's, um, you know, high yield, and all, but it's really because, you know, we, we, the, the internet model has access to the promotional fares. Let's jump back to the Virgin cases, the Virgin Australia case is interesting, Virgin yeah. Blue to Virgin Australia. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what, what that was was an adaptation to a niche as much as anything. It wasn't a, a keenness to become more frills. It was really saying, hey, look, Qantas has got all this juicy yield in the market and we could grab it if we wanted to. It's a bit sort of like Adam and Eve just go. Yeah, but it's also because you can't survive where you are because you're stuck in the middle, right? Uh, well, how, would, would they have been able to survive at a higher cost structure with a low-cost product proposition than the other two LCCs? So they're forced. They, they have to decide, look, can we somehow go back and strip out 30% of the cost and we've added? Yes or no? Or keep investing and going the other way. 
that's, that's my take. I, I think they would argue that their costs were lower than Jetstar's initially, but that um, just the market power of Qantas made them move into that space. Now, I mean, you remember Brett Godfrey in those days saying, New the, the New World, yeah, <laughs> we're talking New Age. Uh, the New World, it, it's okay as long as you, you keep your feet on the cost and you just don't go too far with that <laughs> until it becomes very painful. An increasing cost to go after yield. Okay. And, and um, I guess obviously they went past that stage and they've, they've gone wholeheartedly into a competition with a full service camera. Um, there, is, there is a real attraction to go after yields. I mean, yeah. low cost cameras aren't necessarily always low fare, right? I mean, that's right. They can be very, very high fare. Yeah. Um, are you saying that in the long run you can resist that, particularly when no, you see it's not attractive so much partners? resisting, but your ability to survive on an ongoing basis fundamentally depends on your cost advantage, right? Because what is your advantage? Uh, yeah, there are days and all that where you can where you can press high, but you know, are you playing the cost game or are you playing the yield game? But you can't really do both uh, on system. Don't you have to do both? No, no. As in. Uh, if you really want to go yield as in, look, I'm going to charge $10,000 for a trip to Tokyo and give you a suite and uh, you know, limousine service and all that, that's, that's the yield game. So long as there's someone else that's doing that, and you, you basically you can't do things in half measures, I don't think so. Yeah, and I can understand, you, you're always keeping that, that, that handle of cost, it's, it's core to the whole activity. But it, it just seems to be so easy to slip away from it. You've got Again, the, the danger is if someone else comes in underneath you and starts to keep uh, undercutting your price sustainably because they've got a low cost structure. Mm -hmm. And that's when you start to realize, crap, you know, I've got an mm -hmm. underground flag. Yeah. And that's the adaptation to the niche of the whole Darwinian yeah. process. I think probably we've got about two minutes before yeah. you have to run. Yeah. Uh, who's going to be the lucky one to have a question here? Have to be a fairly short one. Oh. Uh, <laughs> right, Professor Ogie, you've got your hand up fastest. Have to be a very, very short question because it'll be a very short answer too. It's coming from behind you. Asran, uh, good to see you here. That the um, um, my question is that how are you using different bases? I, how how do you plan to use? Ah. Different Air Asia bases as Air, Air Asia X launches the uh, medium to long haul flight. Yeah. Look, I, that, that's actually a very good point because I think uh, that will really reshape the aviation landscape. Uh, a model where you, you go from the traditional model of uh, national carrier base, single hub base, to multiple hubs because it, it, it's an immense. Uh, explosion of the power of network when you've got multiple hubs and you can connect multiple points. So, for example, right now, if uh, uh, the same way that AirAsia shortfall has set up, uh, uh, and of course they're not the only ones to do it, uh, and I think the leaders in the industry will be the ones that have multiple hubs, it is so much easier for an AirAsia X to ride on that, right? Whether uh, it's a hub in Tokyo or Bali or Bangkok, and literally you can add flights to the same exact cities where you already have a brand presence, you have an operating presence, you no longer have to really invest in growing a market. And suddenly the consumers in those cities now have multiple choices of direct flights. You're no longer just flying to one base, but you know, it can be five, six, seven bases in the future. Similar to what AirAsia has been able to accomplish in Singapore today, right? It is bigger than practically most of the other Singaporean airlines but the fact that it surrounds Singapore with multiple bases and flies into Singapore. And you can do that even on a wider scale with the combination of both the narrow body and wide body operations. So I think that will, that, that is a real game changer in Asia. Um, just a, a quick follow on to that. I mean, how big is Asia? Where, where, where does the boundary stop? Where can, where can Air Asia not establish a base and be connected with Air Asia X? Well, well, why not Europe? It, absolutely, but it's just Europe right now is in the dumps. Right? Uh, double digit unemployment, uh, you know, real economic malaise. Uh, 2015, they were they bounce back, and you know, eventually they will. Uh, you have much better uh, aircraft capability, including potentially the 240 ton A330 300. Uh, 
uh, and that opens up very interesting possibilities. It's not so much of a, a geographical limitation as in a choice of, uh, you've got fixed capital, fixed planes, where do you want to deploy this capital that gives you the best returns relative to the, to the other markets that you have. You, you've tried the Middle East though, for example, is that, is that a possibility still? So? It is, I mean, we, we've chosen, for example, right now to fly to Tehran, uh, as opposed to the standard Gulf countries, because there's way too much capacity there. Mm -hmm. But Tehran is screaming for uh, capacity, uh, and it's, it's a great route for us. Are you? Relative to some of the other ones, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. How long have you done? I'm done. He's done. <laughs> I'm sorry it had to be so quick. Uh, it's always entertaining, Amy Masran. Thanks very much indeed for Thank coming. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's great. Great. demonstrate the fact that you see convergence because Air Asia X just looks like an airline. Um, cargo is not an option. Uh, it's there. Um, it would be foolish to neglect it. Um, if, if airlines, if full service airlines neglected cargo, most of their passenger flights wouldn't be profitable. And uh, cargo is typically generating about, on passenger flights, close to 10% of revenue. So I think the ratio has still got an opportunity there, and that's key to maintaining the overall cost efficiency. Um, adding cargo doesn't add adding cargo capability doesn't add cost. It's there whether you like it or not. And it doesn't really uh, change the fuel burn very much either. So it's a, it's a byproduct, and as such, uh, you've got to exploit it to revenue maximum. There's a time cost in turnaround, though. There's a time cost in additional handling and that sort of thing. Yeah, but the revenue opportunity is too big to uh, to ignore. But the cost still goes up. Yeah, but, but incrementally, it's, it's not, um, you don't have the option saying we're going to have a non, you won't bother with cargo, that would be a big mistake. The other thing is in terms of, uh, you know, why are people doing this, why are people going along the hall, it's where the revenue is. Um, I painted a picture of Asian aviation is generating, I think it's about $160 billion in revenue. And if you say, well, how much of that has been captured by the LCCs, you'll hear that the LCCs represent 20, 25% of departures in short haul markets. Uh, but that 159 billion is a global revenue figure for all airlines based in Asia, including long haul and cargo and everything else. How much of that 159 billion has been captured by LCCs based in Asia? Seven? Add them up. You know, it's, well, you don't publish numbers, but some of you do. So if you add up the revenues for um, uh, Jetstar, uh, AirAsia, AirAsia as a group, AirAsia X included, um, it's a few billion dollars. Um, globally, the LCCs have captured somewhere around uh, 70 billion dollars out of the 600 billion dollar industry, something like 12%. So it's where the revenue is. It's not strain or being forced for competitive reasons. It's saying, where's all this revenue? You know, in the States, Southwest is about a 15, 16 billion dollar revenue in a hundred and something billion dollar market. So the legacy carriers, thanks to Chapter 11 and various restructuring, are still capturing 80% of the revenue pool. So there's no getting away from the fact that that's the passenger voting in terms of what he wants. He wants long haul, he wants service choice, he wants these things. 
but I agree entirely with Azran that no matter which segment you're in, whether you're running a six-star hotel or a, a one-star hostel, you've got to manage your costs. You've got to be focused on cost efficiency. Um, it's no good letting the costs run away and then think we can make up for it on yield. You've got to be ruthless about managing costs uh, and, and efficiency, no matter which segment you're in. Um, and whether you can do that by single-mindedly focusing on costs and then saying, we'll let the product invent itself, but just manage the cost, which I think was the impression I got from Azra. Um, others would take a different view and say, no, we've got to choose to have different levels of cost and product structure and make that as an explicit decision. Uh, I, was, I was saying in my introduction yesterday that um, pretty much what you're saying there, that, that um, the low cost end of the market virtually globally now is becoming very, very competitive and the number of full service incumbents cannot afford to match those prices because the cost basis is so significantly high. They're making their returns on long haul, which which impliedly means there's a lot of fat on long haul that's there to be captured by, by efficient carriers. And that's pretty much what Emirates and Eddie Habit, or Emirates particularly, are doing. Um, but at the same time, presumably two Aerosia X will be able to do it, as long as they can do the network well. But Andrew Khan, I mean, you're, you're a bit of a purist in uh, in terms of the low-cost model, I mean, how do you see what what uh, what Asram is saying? Um, I've actually got. Um, I look at this in a slightly different different way. Um, LCCs are, are um, private businesses in, in in the main, so pretty much all. So therefore, profit is is the key motive, the key reason for existence. So getting to profits, not just the cost, but it's, uh, you've got to attack the cost. We've got to attack the revenue as well. So what matters is how do you attack, because you're an LCC, how do you attack the revenue whilst not deteriorating your cost? And I think that's really what's going on. And Azram has made the decision uh, that, okay, yeah, maybe cargo adds uh, uh, a little bit to the cost, but the margin is so significant that why not? And, and I, you know, in, in, in that, that's isn't what's going that on. the beginning of the end? Oh, I don't cost a little but bit more. Provided, so you, provided it. you don't lose control of the of the cost. I mean, you know, one of the particularly in this region. I mean, perhaps we're talking too much about catering, but uh, coming back to hybridisation or, or innovation, what I'd like to see is a carrier try no catering on board. Take out all the galleries, put some extra seats in, uh, let customers bring their own catering. Um, just have some space for the black bags. What's the profit effect of that? You know, um, the incremental revenue, the reduced cost, does that beat catering? I don't know. Maybe some bright uh, analyst here can do the, do well, the, uh, it's been, it's been do tried, the numbers. It's been tried in America yeah. where you, you could buy a sandwich uh, at the gate as you, as you boarded the plane, or Still you're encouraged to spend the money at the airport, at the, uh, at the terminal before you get on board the plane. And bring you just the galleys on board. I agree, yeah. I agree. That, yeah. and that's a hilarious thing. Is, uh, yeah. he, just, he doesn't mind charging for toilets, but he's interested in reducing the number of toilets on board. Yeah. And the idea of getting rid of galleys um, and more real estate for seats. Um, so that way of thinking. Um, but let's, yeah, perhaps we're not talking too much about catering. Let's, let's uh, look I'd be interested in hearing from anybody in the room who's got a two-class operation, short or long haul. What, what do you think is the, the winning strategy um, or what have you learned so far, if we haven't found a winning strategy, about what is the front end? What's, why do you bother? I gather from yesterday's, I wasn't here, but I gather the number of people have got multi-class, even on short. Um, and in the long haul, everybody's doing it. Why is that? What, and what's the key to uh, uh, making that front end pay? Campbell? As a traveller, I can understand it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and I think that, uh, in some respects, answers the question. Um, particularly in the medium to long haul market, um, people will, some people will pay for an extra leg room. Some people will pay for an extra width. Some people will pay for a cabin which is 32 seats rather than 150 seats. Um, yes, there is a, a, a cost in terms of space. Um, to provide that facility, but if people are paying more than the space costs you, uh, again, there's the margin involved. Uh, when you're operating large aircraft, um, there's also the, I guess, the, the challenge of filling that, filling that last 20% of the capacity. And are you, do, are you able to fill that last 20% of the capacity at 
uh, the same yield as you filled the first 80% or are you having to discount in order to do so? So th there's a trade-off to be made and I think given that there's people prepared to upsell and pay the increment for more space and that there is a degradation of yield as you fight to fill that last few percentage points of capacity, uh, that's why I think you see carriers offering two-class products. Um, it comes back to the earlier point that I think Azran made. Um, you, you can focus on unit cost forever, and you should focus on unit cost, but if you take that to the logical extreme, you end up with a 900-seat A380. And if you can only fill 400 of those seats, you'll kill yourself. What would your yield be on the front end uh, compared to average back end? About double. Double, yeah. I remember a previous conversation with Azran in the early stages, they inherited a config in terms of the aircraft. And they were, they were averaging about 2 to 1, 2.1, 2.2. Mm -hmm. And they reconfigured when they had the opportunity. They took out a lot of business seats, put in a smaller number of flatbeds. In fact, cheekily, one of my slides on, you know, um, customer service innovation, those were actually Air Asia X light flat beds, just no service included, as, as he said. But he was trying to shift to getting to three to one. And the majors are getting three to four to one, which is why business class cabins are, there are a lot of them, and there are an amazing number of people flying in them. Um, and there's still tremendous competition to you know, compete for that space. But in the LCC arena, it seems that the sweet spot is more like economy plus, old-fashioned business and still trying to, to get that two-to-one advantage. And the problem is, can you get a similar low factor? And the answer is no, you can't. So then you're stuck where you're looking at 80% down the back. And you can't achieve that at the front, which is why the seat numbers have come down and they added more economy seats. But still, they, they're soldiering on. They haven't gone for the, oh, to hell with it. Because um, I agree with you that it's, it's insane to think that the whole market can't be differentiated. Uh, in terms of additional legroom, when you're talking four, five, six, eight, ten hours. Um, absolutely clear to me that the market should be segmented. The question is, what's the right mix? And it varies from market to market, so what's the winning configuration? Well, we, I mean, we talk innovation. I mean, how hard is it to make it very attractive for me rocking up as, a, as an economy class passenger? Say, oh, at the gate, oh, for another 50 bucks, how would you like to sit up the front in a much more comfortable seat? I mean, do you, does your yield management uh, at present allow that sort of thing to happen? Yes, yes it does. Uh, but that is nothing new. Well, SKL has been doing that for, for many years. Um, we do it. It's $99, depending on where you fly, and a lot of people take it up. I think one of the interesting things in this is also how you do the two class. I mean, one is the size of the, of the cabin, but Campbell, maybe correct me if I, if I get these figures wrong, but I believe with your triple sevens, everybody knows the, the, the Scoot triple sevens came from Singapore. And I believe you put 40% extra seats on, if, if I've got that right, but you took 10 tons of weight, 10 tons of weight off, something like that? 7%, uh, Yeah, I'm not sure what okay. it works to in terms of tonnage. Yeah, yeah. but you know, you, it, it just really, that, that I found very insightful into, in terms of how you execute, you know, the cabin setup. And uh, for me, that's uh, uh, illustrative of how um, LCC thinking is approaching two-class, you know, is coming into the provision of two-class service. You know, I mean, it's a, that, that, that's staggering, 40% and then, uh, you know, that, that, that huge weight reduction. Very interesting. Well, our race director don't have in-flight entertainment uh, for weight reasons. And they say, the seat is what it is, but we don't call it business class because there is no service. So it's the same way as what you're saying. Focus on, we can afford the real estate if the, the yield uh, multiple is enough. Um, we're not gonna uh, create complexity and cost in terms of the service proposition for the crew. Um, and we're gonna minimize the weight. If they bring their own iPads, you know, we'll try and give them a pass on. Um, but it, it's still, uh, when I look around um, the different operators, uh, some of the short haul operators are often business class. You see how Virgin have gone way down to that end. But even others are still saying, no, we're going to have a few seats at the front of the aircraft, but it is a different proposition. Um, I think that's interesting, because even in the narrow body, uh, you know, they're saying that in this market in Asia, and I think North Asia, which is what we're focusing on in this conference, in particular, where incomes are much higher than Southeast Asia, 
And so the idea of you know, whether people want to uh, trade up, I think, is, is much more likely, even on not, not long haul. Uh, but it's tricky because aircraft have to operate to different places. So you have the same edit we all have. We optimize the configuration that works great for one set of routes. It doesn't work so well for a bunch of others. No one's invented the, uh, you know, the flexi. Well, the, the Europeans tried to by moving the curtain, uh, you know, the headrests uh, divider. But um, that was uh, never very attractive in terms of uh, intra-Europe business class, which is uh, disappearing, of course. Any, uh, any other questions in the audience? Yeah. Can I get a mic down here, please? But at the same time, while we're waiting for the question, um, some of the airlines, like EasyJet, they say that they would go into the business class market as well, but then they keep their pitch 27 or 28 inches. And if you're a business class, or if you're a business passenger, you do want to open up your laptop and you do want to start working at 27 inches, it, uh, it does become uh, quite hard, especially if you're Peter's size. So, Although, if I can say it next, it does help quite often. That's what I do. Yep, the laptops are getting smaller. Laptops are getting smaller. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, not small enough. <laughs> the small enough. Yeah. 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 No, there's a entry. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, slightly different question, but uh, related to hybridization. Um, there's an airline in Japan called Skywalk. And at this point, the kind of uh, brand itself is a uh, hybrid operator between the low cost areas and the legacy areas. Now, currently, they're only operating in the domestic market, but uh, in two years' time, they're starting to fly long haul. And the plan is to fly all business class, and they only focus on well, at the moment like Tokyo to New York City and Tokyo to London. Do you think that will work? What, I just want to hear your opinions on, on how, what do you think of for all business class level for a hybrid um, carrier? My Japanese isn't good enough to, but uh, good luck. <laughs> I don't, I don't think so. I mean, uh, to be honest, we've we've got a a very recent experiment in that respect, which was Hong Kong Airlines flew all business class um, services to London, which you would expect, you know, there to be real opportunity to work, and they've had to pull the service in six months. At the heart of it, you know, business passengers are generally, you know, quite conservative. They, you know, they've got to get to their meeting on time, uh, etc. Uh, you've got to say, what's going to persuade them to switch? Uh, it might happen in the long, you know, in the long run. There are some business class operators still surviving. Open skies across the Atlantic does does quite well, but uh, um, you know that's backed by British Airways. So there's a sort of like a almost like a, a guarantee of quality that goes with that. So I, I would, I would, uh, you know, the Skymark have done very well, but I think they're taking a big gamble. Is my is my reading. There's an interesting thing actually. Uh, I was mentioning before that uh, this Emirates Qantas tie-up, um, Qantas has arguably the best frequent flyer program in the world for an airline, and uh, something like um, I think 80% um, of all households in Australia uh, are mem have a member of, of, of the Qantas frequent flyer program. And one of the things that Tim Clark, the CEO of Emirates, said in, in the context of this tie-up is one of the things, one of the key things we love about Qantas is you Australians' obsession with frequent flyer points. And don't underestimate that. I mean, that's, that's why I think a, a number of low-cost carriers are actually moving into the frequent flyer programs as well, isn't it? I mean, and, and with, um, with Air Hong Kong, I mean, apart from the fact that Cafe was brutal, as, as it always is, against any competition, and, and in quite legal ways, um, the frequent flyer issue is, is always there, isn't it? Uh, the, the history of all business across the Atlantic, there were three operators all failed. Um, even Open Skies, which is a, a BA experiment in France, um, they changed the contract to being two class, um, from being all uh, single class business. Um, Singapore Airlines um, had the BA to move to New York, which is very skewed towards. Uh, it business. works in some markets, I think. I think private air operated all business class between Kuwait and Frankfurt, uh, which, which I've traveled on. It, 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 I don't know if that's still around, but some markets you it's can the, see it, this, the, possibly. But. The problem is if you're an independent operator, um, you've got the problem that you're not competitive on frequent flyer and the, the yeah. implicit promise of if something goes wrong, we've got backup um, and schedule integrity and so on, and the frequent flyer points is the additional value proposition. Um, it's hard for an independent 
for a major offering it, the problem is the aircraft is single purpose. What do you do on holidays? What do you do on Christmas Day? What do you do on weekends when people don't want to fly? It, it, has, it serves no purpose. This was the problem that uh, Hong Kong uh, Airlines had as well. So, in general, uh, it doesn't seem to work. I think, uh, I think the key for that is who they are targeting for. Because, I mean, just my personal view or personal opinion, I think, they are not really targeting business class people. I mean, they are offering business class at the price of an, an economy uh, take a fair, just like what uh, I think Jonathan mentioned you know, from spring yesterday. The spring plus, or so I, I forgot the name, but he mentioned about yeah, business class at the price of the economy in front of take it. And I think this is what they're trying to do. I, I don't think business, like for example, I travel, say when I go on business trips, obviously I will pick uh, you know, the FSA because I don't pay for the ticket and I've got to save my miles. But if you look at the full service carriers, I think British Airways said about 25% of people traveling in business are actually traveling uh, in business class and not traveling on business. They're just traveling on leisure. Um, and for them, it's, it's affordable. Um, so I, I don't buy it. I mean, the idea that you can fly business for an economy class fare, um, if, you can, if you can find that magic way, I just don't think the margins uh, are that good. I mean, it's tempting to look at list prices and think that you can uh, disrupt this business model, but as uh, we just heard in terms of Hong Kong, when you're up against Cafe and other majors and, and their frequent fly program, and more, more importantly, their corporate travel, uh, corporate discounting, you know, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs uh, negotiate good deals, and um, you know, the, we shouldn't exaggerate just how lucrative business class travel is. It can be profitable, um, but it's, it's not an open invitation for anyone to play. You've got to match the service, and it turns out that it's a competitive business. Uh, like any other. I think this point, I come back to the point about there aren't many routes where you can uh, reliably fill up an all business class aircraft you know, enough days of the year to make it worthwhile. Um, and I think private air, you mentioned private air, most of the time the, what the white label will have done are for Swiss. So special routes. Uh, Zurich to New York, for example, they they would just they would be one of the sort of connecting points. Mm -hmm. But it would be Lufthansa, uh, Lufthansa uh, um, code that they fly under. So there, there are very few routes that they fly on their own. When you had Daimler Chrysler and they were moving executives between two centers in uh, one in Europe, a car set manufacturing in Europe and uh, America, you know there was demand, and uh, sometimes on an oil route. But mostly businessmen are traveling uh, on common routes, which are well linked. And that comes back to a point that was made earlier, which I just re-emphasize. In Europe, you won't see EasyJet and Ryanair going head-to-head -head on, on routes. In Asia, you've got routes with three LCCs and five legacy carriers and a few more besides. You look at Singapore, Bangkok, uh, Singapore, Jakarta, Hong Kong, Singapore. Only in Asia do you see this level of competition um, between full-service carriers. Today, I saw that Singapore Airlines uh, are launching uh, wide body 777s to Yangon in Myanmar. Silk Air is already operating you know, multiple services. Um, so Asia is, people uh, lecture Asia on when are we going to liberalize. Um, you already see levels of competition and experimentation uh, and customer choice in Asia, which far outstrip anything you'll see in America or, uh, or Europe. On your, on your question, I'd, I'd very much like to see an all business class operation between Sydney and, uh, and Hong Kong. Um, coming up here, as I did, the economy class fare is $900, uh, which is pretty much the same with Qantas and uh, Cafe Pacific, Qantas and Virgin. The business class fare is $7,700. Change oh, it, change it, it has four flights a day up. I, I have to admit, I, I, don't, I wouldn't write off the idea of an all business class. I mean, um, you know, our company worked quite closely with, with Silverjet, and uh, so we were, we were uh, privy to all the, you know, the, the financial information. The business class Atlantic. operation across the Atlantic. Silverjet almost worked, and the only reason it failed is it got, it got hit by the, the high oil price. They made a couple of mistakes along the way. Honestly, they were undercapitalized. They simply could not get investors to take a risk because it was a it was an unproven model. So with the lack of capitalization, the oil price, but it, it, it worked. I mean, the, the, 
the, the, the load factors were very respectable, 60, 70, 80 percent. They were not having to discount hugely to get them. Uh, they, they just fell that last couple of yards short. Um, I, and, 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 and you've got to also ask yourself, how is it five-star boutique hotels with low, you know, room rates survive? What's the difference? But they do. You know, and, but they don't have the economies of scale of uh, you know of lots of cheap, uh, you know, cheaper, cheaper smaller rooms. Yeah. Um, question down there, if you could get a mic, please. I think we'll take the last question. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm Ken Choi from JJR uh, in Korea. Um, as a event rising, um, starting startup LCC have a constant uh, struggle of how much of budget allocation that we have to put into marketing and adver advertisement. Uh, in a perfect world, uh, you know, if, if we put the lowest fare on our website, the consumers meticulously find that and uh, we enhance the yield and uh, uh, hire the uh, low factors, but uh, it doesn't work exactly that way and uh, we are relying on, especially in overseas sales, Says, and uh, we also uh, depend a lot on the local um, travel agencies. So I understand that you have uh, significant experiences in Europe and Asia, and uh, do you have some opinions uh, what media has worked better for um, LCCs and uh, you know, how much of a budget allocation uh, could LCC as a you know, cost limit can afford? I think um, uh, what media works depends on the country, uh, but uh, and obviously every you know uh, country every country is different in terms of internet penetration, uh, mobile phone penetration. But if I might add something just to, to what you said, a key thing that is overlooked is the payment side of it. It's all very well uh, uh, you know uh, putting your marketing out on the internet. But if people don't have credit or debit cards or payment mechanisms, it doesn't matter. So, you know, that's the sort of second half of the equation that a lot of airlines don't get right. They don't pay attention to the payment side because it's boring. Uh, if you get that right and you've got a good selection of, of, of booking channels and a good selection of payment channels, then that hugely facilitates the booking process. I think from the full service carrier's point of view, obviously, like all advertising, it's shifting more uh, onto online. Um, I imagine the payment structure is, uh, is also important, both from a cost point of view and in terms of penetration into different markets. Um, in, in, in Vietnam or India, credit card penetration is 3%. So internet penetration is much, much higher, 30 or 40%, but credit cards are only 3%. So, if you haven't got an alternative payment mechanism to credit cards, it doesn't matter that you're marketing and selling through the internet, the, the customer can't buy. So that's how you have fulfillment through convenience stores, yeah. Um, yeah. telephone payment, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but that's changing. I mean, uh, the credit card and debit cards are, are spreading um, and, and will soon be ubiquitous, I think. But it's a good point in terms of penetrating the markets. But the question of how you yield management, you've got multiple channels of traditional agents online, your own website, and the fact that people have visibility, yeah, that's a headache for everybody. Um, it meant that full service carriers were very tentative about selling online originally. Um, they've slowly, uh, particularly in the States, they've moved aggressively to shift over to that model because they, uh, they're trying to uh, minimize how much they're, they're held to ransom by the GDSs. But, uh, Meanwhile, uh, when the LCCs seem to be moving towards, well, maybe a bit of travel agents are a necessary evil, particularly in markets like Japan, um, and we all end up in, you know, having multiple channels. No one can be a purist from the point of view, come to my website, that'll, that'll be the way to do it. Um, and once you start interlining and having co-chair agreements, uh, you're involved with how you do fulfillment for all of your partners. Um, and that brings you to the mainstream. So I think it comes back to the fact that it's not just the customers who want to interline, but working together um, becomes part of everyone's, uh, well, more and more people's business model. Um, you know, Emirates, 
aren't member of an alliance, but they might as well be. Um, they are an alliance. Yeah. yeah. They have friends. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we resolved any of the, the questions here. You know, we raised a number of uh, points, very good points, I think, and uh, uh, certainly teased out some of the issues. I guess in, in the end run, it, it does come down to a matter of definition. It does come down to uh, creativity, innovation, and, and, and just what particular markets you're operating in. Um, we'll, we'll wind up there um, and, and take, a, take a half hour coffee break. If you could be back, please, at uh, the 11.45 prompt. So we're running about half an hour late on the break. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll move into the next session then. Um, but meanwhile, if you'd kindly thank our, our panel here for a very interesting <laughs>